before sunrise, a neighbor, next door neighbor, smells smoke, and he goes outside and he thinks he can see smoke coming out of the Sheridan house. He calls 911 and they send out fire and police right away. What they found was Joyce Sheridan had been stabbed multiple times. She was dead. She was lying on the floor. They find John Sheridan under the armoire. He's stabbed and on fire. John Sheridan had worked basically his whole career in New Jersey politics, and he was sort of an informal advisor, if not an official advisor, to several uh, governors. So the detectives and the prosecutor sit down and meet with the brothers and they say, well, look, your father killed your mother and then tried to stab himself and couldn't do it. Then the brothers get access to the house and they just can't believe what they find. Like the rug that their father died on, that is a blood stain, is sitting rolled up in the hallway. There's no fingerprint dust. How soon did they start looking into a guy like Bonnet? Immediately, yes, that week. Now what did he find? Well, see, this is super interesting, right? <laughs> What's cooking, everybody? I am joined in the bunker today by the reporter who potentially may have broken this whole case you just heard about in the intro wide open, Nancy Solomon of WNYC. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Nancy did a deep dive investigation on the Sheridan murders for about two years. She'll talk about it today in some of the process. And what that culminated in was a podcast called Dead End. And Dead End is released on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts on audio. It also has the audio versions on YouTube as well. And I will put the links to it down in the description below. Please go check it out. It's incredible work. Anyway, Nancy put that out in April and May. And by the time she got to the end of the podcast, she actually had to put out an emergency 10-minute episode to announce that the case had been reopened officially as a result of her work. Now, you'll hear all about the implications and why this isn't just some normal murder, and you're also going to hear all about some of the other investigations Nancy's done that could or could not be tied directly to what happened to the Sheridans in their home almost exactly eight years ago as this episode is coming out in September 2014. This one was a wild episode. I really, really appreciate Nancy coming in, and I'd appreciate you guys sharing this around on the different platforms as well because we'd love to spread the word. It's just amazing work she's done, and... And I hope it can solve the case, too. Sounds like we're on a good path. Anyway, if you're on YouTube right now, please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that like button on the video. And as always, please give me your thoughts about this episode and the case down in the comments below. To everyone who has been sharing around the episode with their friends, thank you so much. That's a huge, huge help. Let's keep that rolling. To everyone who is on Apple or Spotify right now, thank you for checking out the show over there. If you haven't already, please be sure to leave a five-star review on either one of those platforms. And I look forward to seeing you guys again for future episodes. That said, you know what it is. I'm Julian Dory. This is Trendifier, and please welcome Nancy Solomon. Nancy Solomon, thank you for coming down here. Mm, thanks for having me. Nice long ride down the turnpike into South Jersey. That's exactly right. Don't hold the South against us here. If that's <laughs> never <cool>. do. <laughs> My favorite part of the state. It's so interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, I love it down here. Where are you originally from? Uh, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. And how'd so you how'd you end up in New Jersey? Um, a part, my partner at the time got a job at Rutgers. Mm, okay. So I had been living on the West Coast for many years, uh, and we moved, uh, with our son to South Orange, New Jersey. Gotcha. Okay. But you have now been entrenched in covering what's mostly New Jersey politics for a lot of years for WMYC. That's right. And the reason I'm having you in here today is because... You released an unbelievable podcast that everyone here should listen to. It's called Dead End. It's on all platforms, including YouTube, and but it's audio only, I think, right? Yes. Okay. And you went way below the surface of what is probably the coldest case murder, definitely in the political sphere, in the history of New Jersey, and one of the coldest cases, period, in the history of New Jersey on the Sheridans. So, quick question before we start. What got you into this? How did you end up in this story? Because this, this happened in 2014, and maybe, if you don't mind, provide a little background on who the Sheridans were and, and what went down. Sure. 
So uh, John and Joyce Sheridan lived uh, in the suburbs outside of Princeton. Uh, and John Sheridan had worked basically his whole career in New Jersey politics. Uh, he started out working uh, for, after law school, he went to work for a governor, and then he became the transportation commissioner, so a member of the cabinet for Governor Tom Kane in the 80s. Um, and then he went from that to uh, working at one of the top law firms in the state as a lobbyist. So he worked in Trenton, building relationships with people uh, in the legislature and working on public policy and lobbying for clients. Um, and he was sort of an informal advisor, if not an official advisor, to several uh, governors. He had a close relationship with Christine Todd Whitman. Mm. Um, when was she governor again? I so, know that. yeah, in the 90s, like the yeah. late 90s. Okay. Um, and then I think when George W. Bush became president in 2000, she went to the um, Environmental Protection Agency and was a, in his cabinet, became the commissioner for that. So, yeah, it was right up to 2000. And then McGreevy was after her? Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Now I got it. Um, testing my political knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta start hot here. <laughs> Don't have any notes in front of me here. Um, anyway, so John Sheridan was very well known. I mean, we start the podcast with his funeral because we felt like it really gave you, the listener, a sense of uh, a guy who was not a household name, was not known by the public, mm. but was known really well in political and sort of power circles of New Jersey. There were 1,800 people at his memorial service, at, which included the entire state legislature, essentially, and every other, you know, and four former governors. It was just, you know, a real showing of who he was. Um, so that's John and Joy Sheridan. They were found dead in their bedroom in September, the morning of September 28th, which was a Sunday morning. So Saturday night into Sunday morning, uh, in 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time I was, uh, editing and supervising our New Jersey coverage for WNYC. We're the, uh, NPR affiliate in New York. So public radio, we run the NPR shows that people are very familiar with and then put our own local reporting into those shows. So um, so I was focused on New Jersey news coverage um, at the time, as I have been for many years. And um, the murders, or at the time, the deaths, we didn't know what, what had happened, uh, were just incredibly intriguing to pretty much you know, anybody who followed New Jersey politics, because John Sheridan was well known, as I said, but he also, because he worked at, at the time, he had taken a job running Cooper University Hospital in Camden. And that hospital is uh, run by and is kind of the what we call the jewel in the empire crown of George E. Norcross III, who is a very powerful South Jersey Democrat and, uh, you know, a power broker, a party boss. We'll definitely um, talk about we'll, him we today. We will be talking <laughs> about that. Um, so, you know, the fact that John Sheridan worked for this man who's so well known and so powerful in the state um, in terms of New Jersey politics, um, yeah, that was immediately intriguing to me, to many uh, reporters. And then as the details about the crime scene and the little bit, the, 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 the detectives weren't talking much, but the little bits and pieces that were dribbling out in the month after that, it just got kind of stranger and stranger, which, you know, makes you more curious about something. So I was very curious about this in 2014 uh, because we're a New York station and we cover really like the northern half of New Jersey. Um, and um, we don't we don't cover South Jersey that much. So it was really kind of far afield for us. And we mm. didn't like we didn't assign a reporter to the story. We didn't cover it in that way. So I was just kind of keeping tabs on it and watching it myself. Fast forward to 2019, I was working on a series of stories all year long during the calendar year of 2019, um, looking at 
the political machines in New Jersey and the party bosses and how that system works. We often hear about political machines, but how do they work exactly? Yeah. How do people gain power? How do they hold on to that power? What do they benefit from it? And how do they use those levers of power? Those were kind of the questions I was interested in. I never really got beyond George Norcross and Camden because I started reporting on him first and there was just so much to do. It took up the whole year and that's all I had for that project was a year. Because he, so, to be clear, I just want to make sure I've, I'm following correctly mm -hmm. here as well. Because I was, as I told you on the phone, I was actually way less knowledgeable on Norcross and his whole history because he's more of a behind the scenes guy. But my understanding is that he's also, he's effectively like the head of the New Jersey machine himself. Like, not just South Jersey. Well, you know, the, every county has its own political machine, but he effectively built a statewide operation. And he, he did it in a couple, you know, a few different ways. But he basically created a coalition that was sort of allowing him to handpick, you know, the Senate president. Right. Um, he had insurance. He has insurance business all over the state. So he... Um, builds political relationships that lead to being able to get some of that government business, ensuring, you know, town councils to city halls, police fire, that sort of thing. So he was really building, after he solidified and built the South Jersey Democratic machine, he then started working in many ways that would be considered statewide. So he has he's often referred to kind of in shorthand in news articles as, you know, the most powerful uh, political person in New Jersey who's unelected because, right. you know, the governor is more powerful on paper at the very on least. On paper. <laughs> um, but here's a guy who has uh, relationships and has been able to, you know, do it. I mean, he does it quite well. He, yes. He, and some of it is like genuine you know, using professional pollsters and using data and running campaigns. Like, he brought a level of success and professionalism uh, to many South Jersey campaigns. Um, and, you know, he built this operation through, you know, smart investments in these campaigns. So right. anyway, so in 2019, I was working on looking at how the political machine operates and... I kind of tripped into a, uh, a the waterfront development in Camden, and mm. and George Norcross's involvement in it, and that's when I realized that John Sheridan, who had been kind of just this mystery off in the back of my mind for many years, was connected to that land deal and and what was going on in in Camden at the time in 2014. And I was uh, told that he had had a major falling out with George Norcross over that land, those land deals and waterfront development in Camden. While and you were investigating In this. 2019, while Got I was it. investigating okay. that stuff. So that kind of like, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I, I was just so, um, I kind of hadn't put those two different stories in, the, in my mind together. Um, and that's when I started thinking about this as a true crime podcast. Um, and I pitched the idea that we could dig into the crime story uh, and also tell a story about political machines and possibly corruption in New Jersey. And that the, that the, the one, you know, it would be a great story to tell to get folks interested by with this really interesting, compelling mystery um, and then do a little explaining of how the system works and, you know, where we could make the connections we would and where we couldn't, we wouldn't. And when did you start actually work that you pitched the idea in 2019? Yeah, at the very end of the year. Mm -hmm. And then when did you start? Because people will find when they listen to this podcast, it's not like this kind of podcast. You went and did interviews in person with people. You had narratives to it. You had... You had music in there. It was so well produced. Everything was so well done. But like, when did you, I guess, like commence the actual recording? January first, twenty twenty. We started wow. right away. Wow. Uh, I mean, I had I had pitched the idea in probably you know in September October of twenty nineteen. I I was starting to think about it, 
And um, and so it went through that process at the end of 2019, and we were ready to hit the ground running at the beginning of the year. I didn't realize you were recording this for like two years. Yeah. That well, is... there were a few breaks. So then, so January 2020, we start working on it. March 10th, 2020, right. we go home and stop going to the office. And it was, and COVID obviously was so huge. I just went back to my news job in the newsroom covering New Jersey because it was just, there was too much going on and I, I was needed. It was an all hands on deck kind of situation. And uh, and it was hard to think about this other project. It was just so, such a, and we didn't realize how long it was going to go on for. You know, we thought, okay, uh, you know. Two weeks gonna, to stop the curve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, it was about, it, I didn't really pick it back up until January of 2021. So it was the rest of that year. So a good eight months or whatever that That's is. That's still a long time um, working on this. Right. So then I really worked on it that year. I took another long break of about six weeks in the fall of 2021 for the gubernatorial election in New Jersey uh, when Phil Murphy got reelected. So I worked on that. Um, and then I went back full time onto the podcast and we uh, it, we launched at the end of April of 2022. Right. And you put it all out over like what, a six week period, something like eight. that? Eight, eight week period. And there yeah. were eight total episodes. Yeah. And the seventh was unplanned. Yes. We'll, we'll get to that. I'll, okay. I'll leave that one there. So thank you so much for the full background because there's people right now listening, their heads are spinning because there's a <laughs> lot on the bone there. Yeah. So we will, I wasn't stopping you on Norcross and some of that other stuff. We will get to that all in, in due time. But to go back to the actual murder itself, which you did outline the basics of who the Sheridans were, it was a husband and wife. You mentioned who John was and Another thing in there that I don't know if you said this, but it's something that I read a lot in this story. And when I talk to other people in New Jersey who knew the guy, like it's unanimously said, is that he was in a in an unbelievably corrupt state. He was a very well liked guy. He was a there was someone I was listening to who had a perfect term for it, like on the morality spectrum, where he was. They were like he was. I forget the word. I, it's it's on the tip of my tongue, but they were they were basically saying he was uncorruptible. I think that's what they were saying. Like he was one of those guys who truly, you know, in in the politics wheeling and dealing behind the scenes, understood that things were not exactly on the up and up in certain places, but on his end of things was someone who was reliable to both parties to be able to go to and have a friendly ear. And so, like you said, he ends up being the CEO of a major hospital. I mean, Cooper's a big time hospital. It also happens to be in Camden, which for people listening right now who don't know about Camden, New Jersey, I was showing you the map of the <laughs> fake map in New Jersey before we yeah. started. I'll put that in the corner of the screen for people where it renames stuff. But they call Camden basically Detroit because the state has just over the years just crushed it of its resources and certain deals maybe took certain parts of the neighborhoods into account that didn't take others into account. We'll talk about that. But, you know. There were so many business and political meeting and butting heads things in the middle of this. And yet, when John Sheridan died, none of that, to your point, was really looked at. They, the, the case itself was actually a clusterfuck from the beginning. Let's call it what it was. So you mentioned when they died. It was July 2014. And I think you did say... September. I'm sorry, September 2014. Thank you. That's why you're here. <laughs> I think you did say that they were the husband and wife were stabbed to death in their home in the wee hours of Sunday morning, late Saturday night of that that time. But what were can you just take us to the crime scene sure. and what happened from the first step, which you had a lot of people on your podcast, detectives, everything talking about this. You gave a great picture. So I'd love to paint that again here. Sure. So uh, before sunrise on September 28th, uh, a neighbor, next door neighbor, smells smoke. He's up early uh, and he goes outside and he thinks he can see smoke coming out of the Sheridan house. It's hard to tell because it's dark, uh, but he can definitely smell the smoke. He calls 911 and they send out fire and police right away. And they ask him to go knock on the door and see if he can get anyone who's in the house out of the house. 
um, and wake them up. So he starts banging on the door. And all of this is on the 911 recordings. Mm. Um, and he's trying to, he's ringing the doorbell, banging on the door, and he nobody comes. And um, the police and firefighters get there. They go inside. The house is filled with smoke. Uh, they eventually, they clear the bottom floor. They go upstairs. And the master bedroom door is closed, and they can't open it. And so it takes them a while to get into the, the bedroom. Uh, it turns out that a very large wooden armoire was tipped over on its, you know, on its bottom, uh, laying on the floor, blocking the door. Mm. So uh, this turns out to be a crucial piece of information because uh, what they found was Joyce Sheridan had been stabbed multiple times she was lying, she was dead. She was lying on the floor. Um, and John Sheridan was, and the, the room's on fire. They have to put out the fire. They find John Sheridan under the armoire. He's been, he's stabbed. Uh, and the armoire is on top of him and on fire. And um, so... This is the and so this is the scene that they find. Mean so and the firefighters put out the fire and start tossing everything that's in the room into the bathroom that's adjacent to the bedroom. I guess you know it's smoldering and they want to like and so anyway so the crime scene you know we all watch these detective yes. stories right the crime scene's really messed up because um, of the fire essentially and, yeah, yeah and they they've and then uh, they bring the bodies out to the front to the ambulance um, and when the detectives arrive they're told the detective that I interviewed whose job it was was to photograph the house the crime scene the bodies um, he was told don't worry about the the stairwell ignore that because there was blood all along the walls of the stairwell and on the stairs and he was the his captain told him that the firefighters had told the captain that th this was the blood that spilled when they took Joyce Sheridan out of the house on the walls on the yeah the bottom of the walls okay. um and it was smudged and it was like they were carrying her out and they spilled she you know they, there was a lot of blood spilled and it smeared on the walls um and so he didn't photograph the stairwell mm. which turns out to be another crucial issue later on so uh the detectives take one look at this situation the the room is blocked from the inside. They couldn't get in at first. They know that the firefighters and police couldn't get in at first. Um, there's almost $1,000 in cash sitting out in the open on the uh, bedside table. There's an iPad. There are phones. Um, so robbery's so, out. And so they think this isn't a robbery. This isn't a home invasion. There's no sign... There was no sign of forced entry at the at either the front or the back door. There are no broken windows, so they um, they decide really quick quickly that they think they're dealing with a murder suicide, and that pretty much governs everything that they do going forward, which turns out to be a real problem. Were the bodies when they brought them out to the ambulance? You know that that fire had been going at least had started effectively for at least a half hour before then, I would imagine. Something like that? Yeah, and, and the detectives were quickly were able to determine that uh, there was a gas can in the room and that their gas had been poured on the floor and lit. There was a pack of matches, the gas can, so it was all there in, in the room. So I'm not a fire expert, but I know fire spreads pretty fast, especially with gas cans. How were their bodies not just completely burned? I think that because all the doors were closed and the windows were closed, they it, the fire lacked oxygen. Is I, mm. I, I, no one ever told me that, but that's kind of I think what could be um, deduced at this point. Okay, I, I never really got into that question. I have to. It's a good one, um, but I think it, the the fire definitely burned. You know, there was a lot of damage in the room, and John Sheridan's body was badly burned. Um, but it wasn't like a raging fire it, to the point where it destroyed everything. Okay. So they bring the bodies out. They didn't collect the blood, as you said. And the 
somebody told somebody who told somebody, the end guy taking the pictures, that, oh, it got smudged on the wall on the way down. So we'll, as you said, we'll, we'll get to that and where that came up. But what else besides also the firemen having to move some of the stuff out of the way as they were trying to put it out, what else was wrong with the scene? Um, so, well, let's, let's, how about if we back up a little bit and we introduce sure. Mark Sheridan, the son of John and Joy Sheridan. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, because he, he ended up being very dissatisfied with the investigation and doing a lot of his own investigative work. Um, so I think it makes sense to kind of introduce him. So Mark Sheridan is a, uh, an attorney in New Jersey he, at the time of his, of his father's death, he was the attorney for the state Republican Party, and he was the uh, he worked as an attorney for the Chris Christie campaign. So mm. Chris Christie was the Republican governor in 2014 at the time of the, when this happened. So we're talking about a very you know a guy who's politically connected who's got a lot of important people in his cell phone. Um, and, um, you know, and he, when at first he's sort of believing everything that the detectives are telling him because he's an establishment guy and he believes that these people know what they're doing. They're the professionals. And uh, why would you question them? How old was uh, he at this time? Um, Roughly. A, a good question. Maybe in his 40s. Okay. Um, I hope I'm right on that one. Uh, it, uh, so, um, what happens is, so this, ha this is early Sunday morning on Tuesday, Mark Sheridan and his three brothers, uh, meet with the county prosecutor and the detective. So in New Jersey, all major crimes are investigated by the county prosecutor's office, not the local police. So a, a death like this goes right to them immediately. Okay. It's, it, it's the po local police don't get this case. So they, the detectives and the prosecutor sit down and meet with the brothers and they say, well, you know, they're sort of beating around the bush a little bit and they're kind of trying to be kind of gentle with this information, but they... They're, but they tell uh, the brothers that John Sheridan had hesitation wounds, and they're like, "What? What? what what's a hesitation wound? They don't. What is that?" Uh, and they're sort of not. The prosecutor tries again to explain it, but he's trying to be super like careful and gentle, and he's not being very clear. And finally, like the assistant prosecutor jumps in and says, "Look, your father killed your mother, and then tried to stab himself and couldn't do it." And so, yeah, and just like your reaction, the brothers just like, it, it's of like course. a tinderbox. Yeah. They explode and they're like, no way. Yeah. That did not happen. Um, and so that leads them down a path. Uh, the next day, they're given access back to the house. The crime scene inv part of the investigation of uh, taking evidence is done and they turn the house back to the family is that fast because that's only wednesday that's three days later is that fast for a crime like that it seems fast to me yeah i mean i think what we now know looking back is that they didn't do a whole lot of analysis of that yeah. crime scene because they had made up their minds that it was a murder suicide Hey guys, if you're on YouTube right now and you're enjoying this episode, please be sure to drop a comment down below with your thoughts. I'd love to know what you guys are thinking about this whole case. To everyone who has been sharing around these episodes on social media and with your friends, whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, etc., thank you so much. That's the best possible thing we could do to grow this show and continue to get great guests like this. So let's keep that rolling. And to everyone who hasn't done that yet, I really, really appreciate it if you got on board. Thank you. And, you know, I've, I've talked to other, many other uh, homicide detectives or, you know, former detectives who now teach and, you know, at a university on criminal justice. And, you know, what I've been told is, you know, quite clearly, like, it doesn't matter if you think it was a murder-suicide or not. You're st still, res you know, responsible to do a full investigation to take all the evidence, to analyze it, to keep an open mind and look at every possibility to, you know, to not just come to a judgment and not go look any further. So um, that was the first mistake, I think you could rightly say, sure. that they made. 
Um, then the brothers get access to the house and they just can't believe what they find. I mean, they're just like, you know, really upset and shocked because they see a lot of material in the house that wasn't taken into evidence, like the rug that their father died on and that has a blood stain is sitting rolled up in the hallway. Um, mm. And there's no fingerprint dust. Uh, and so they start to see things like, wait a minute, you know, this doesn't look right. And they already are upset about this determination. But I think at that point, I mean, what the way Mark Sheridan talked about it is he was still, it wasn't until the day that he went to the house and saw the crime scene that he started to doubt the prosecutor's office. Because he also, and again, a guy who is a high level attorney, he works in a state, just like you said, works, it, he was, it was Chris Christie's election campaign, right? Mm -hmm. That's who he was the head attorney yeah. for. So, I would imagine as much of a shock and disbelief that that first news comes from the detectives for a guy like him, it still would probably take going there to actually be like, wait a minute, because he's not the kind of guy who's like, well, I could do this job better than these people. And then you get there, you see a lack of fingerprint dusting going on, like all these problems, and he immediately turns. What's curious to me, though, is when they had that meeting with them, that was on Tuesday, you said? Mm-hmm. So when the prosecutor's meeting with the sons, did they, after revealing that, did they try to get at a motive? Had they even thought about that? Or was this just clearly, no, he had hesitation wounds, so he must have killed her? They said, listen, we see this all the time. We're going to find something. Mom had a boyfriend. Dad had a girlfriend not to be too heteronormative about it, but that's what they said, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, or there were money problems or there were work problems or, you know, there were, or there were drug problems. We'll, we don't know what the motive was, okay. but we'll find out and we'll tell you and we will find out and we will tell you. And so that's, that's what they were told on that Tuesday. And that news didn't break yet, right? Because the memorial was later that week or yeah. something no one knew about this they just thought they were murdered still when when did when did it hit the public airways where the detectives were saying hey we think we think he killed his wife and then killed himself i don't think that was public until um february or march of the following year mm. but there were rumors and there were you know uh, Christine Todd Whitman, the former governor, told me that at the memorial service, rumors were flying and the story was unbelievable. Um, so she kind of hints that she knew that the detectives believed it was a murder-suicide at that point. Because she, she and um, but certainly, you know, the first the the information came out in bits and pieces. And you know, first it was that the fire was intentionally set. Then it was that they, about a month later, that they were stabbed to death. Um, you know, and you're hearing this stuff, well, the, the, the fire was intentionally set, but he was underneath the armoire? Yeah. Like, what the hell is that about? It's like, yeah, he shot himself and drowned himself at the same time. It's, it's one of those. You hear that. And, and this, this is, a, he was 70 years old, right? Yeah, 70. So it's not like, you know, a 35-year-old guy benching 225 or anything. This was... An older man, and it, it, like to me, I'm not a detective. I'm not. I, I'm not an expert by any means in that stuff. But from an armchair quarterback perspective, the first time you hear just the basics of the crime scene without any of the fingerprints, which they didn't even get, without any of the other data, you're like, someone else had to be there. This makes no sense. And the thing that I don't know that you said, but it's worth saying at least for people wondering, well, how does someone just get in the house? This was in Skillman, New Jersey. Skillman is outside Princeton. It's Bougieville, USA. They don't let people like me in places like that. It's very, very nice. The, my understanding is that no one in the neighborhood even locked their doors. This is a rural, very high-end neighborhood, and it wasn't even like a thing. So it's perfectly reasonable to say, based on what all the other neighbors said, that someone could just walk in the back door. Yes, that is true. That There was everyone that I talked to confirmed that the Sheridans did not lock their doors. Um, you know, this was farmland that had been like carved out and suburbs had been built on, on it. I mean, the, when the Sheridans moved there in the eighties, 
or se- late 70s um, or 1980, maybe it was, the, it was just being converted from farmland. And they were one of the first people to build a house on that street. Mm. Um, and, you know, you could hear cows mooing in the distance yeah. when the when the the kids were growing up there and uh so it was yeah it was considered uh a very safe place um you know the the poli- local police had only been called to the house once in the 30 years that they lived there and that was when Joyce fell down and uh injured her hip um and you know they're just there wasn't a whole lot of crime. And there was also, I think you had this in your podcast as well. If you didn't, then I may have read it somewhere so you can tell me if this is true or not. But there was apparently a neighbor who the week before, the Sunday morning before, like a full week, he was pulling out of his driveway at around 5 a.m., something like that. And as he's – again, rural place, the people aren't coming through there at 5 a.m. He goes to pull out and he almost hits a car that's sitting in the middle of the cul-de-sac staring at the Sheridan's house with the lights off. And he's like, oh, shit. And there were two people in there and he didn't think anything of it, pulled away, drove away, rest is history. The cops didn't – was it that the cops didn't even interview that guy or take that into account? Was that another thing there? Yeah. Now, you got that almost exactly right. Uh, The only thing I would edit there in that telling is that um, he thought it was extremely weird when he nearly hit the car backing out of his driveway. Mm. He thought it was it was really strange that there was a car sitting there at five in the morning. Um, And what was even more strange was that they quickly like turned on the engine, peeled out and took a right turn at the next street, which is right before the Sheridan's house, which is a, another dead end cul-de-sac. So they oh, I don't remember so that. Okay, this guy thought these people don't know where they are. They're not local because they know they they're going at a very fast clip right into another dead end. Um, and he wanted to follow them and see what the hell they were up to, uh, but he was afraid. And he felt like that's probably a bad idea to be confronting these people in the dark alone that I don't. And I, you know, that's how menacing and sinister it seemed to him at the time. And he didn't call the cops. Uh, he did not. And then a week later, the, you know, the, the Sheridans are found dead in their bedroom. And the whole neighborhood is, of course, talking about it nonstop. Mm-hmm. And... The, even though the police have told the neighbors there's nothing to worry about, it was a family matter, there's no intruder, um, the people in the neighborhood are like, that couldn't possibly be right and this must be a murder. And so when because of that's the kind of conversations that people are having and he thinks – oh, wait a minute, I saw this thing a week ago (laughs) that was really suspicious. And you know what? It was at exactly the time. It was on, it was Sunday morning, five o'clock in the morning, exactly the time the Sheridans were killed, but a week earlier. Could these people have been casing the joint? That's what he thought. So he called the police and they took a report and he, he could remember, he said at the time he had a, he could remember a lot of detail about the car when I finally, you know, tracked him down seven years later, uh, you know, he couldn't remember the make of the car and, you know, but he remembered the story quite well. Mm. Um, and so, you know, uh, but he never heard back from the police. You know, they took his report, but that's all he ever. They never know. interviewed him. No, as far as I know, no. And that's not, it, I believe you opened up the podcast with the first interview, I think, was with. Joyce's best friend Mm -hmm. and she ended up becoming a character in your story which we'll explain a little more later but she was explaining how at her at Joyce's memorial five days later or whatever she's up on the stage with her husband giving a, a eulogy to Joyce and she mentions how she had lunch with Joyce two days before the murder and as she said it, you interviewed her husband and her husband also said like that moment, I'm like, oh, shit, now the cops are going to talk to us right after this. But the cops never came. Right. So someone, one of the last people, besides her husband, obviously, to see Joyce alive 
was not interviewed by the cops. And also one of the guys calling in a literal tip of something he saw a week before was not interviewed by the cops. Right. Those two things, we'll, all the other stuff we'll talk about too, but like those two things alone right there, yeah. before you even get to the fire poacher or the 70-year-old putting an armoire on top of himself and then stabbing himself to death. I mean, yeah. it's almost like whoever whoever's pulling some strings here just thinks everyone's stupid. I don't know about that, but you know, it, it's it's a real shame that they didn't focus on that car that could have been casing the place because there's only one real main road in and out of that neighborhood. And there is there could have been video of cars that night coming and going, but that's long gone now. Yeah. You know, so uh, to have been able, like, I mean, maybe I, I can't say that they didn't look for that car and they didn't look at the video and they didn't look for a license plate. They might have. But it seems to me that given everything else we know, it's not likely that they did. And that could have been a major break in the in the, in this case. Um, you know, and the thing with, with Chris is it's not just that she was – one of the last people to see Joyce Sheridan alive. They had a three hour lunch. They were best friends. Mm -hmm. And Chris insists that if anything was going on that was problematic in her relationship with her husband, that she, that Chris would have known about it. So you, if the, you're the detective and you think that this was a murder suicide, wouldn't you want to go interview the best friend who had lunch with her to find out yeah. what they were talked about that day? So, um, yeah, that was an amazing story to hear from uh, Bob Stevens, who also, by the way, happened to have worked at the attorney general's office and really knew his way around an investigation. Who's Bob? Chris's husband. Husband, right, okay. So... Um, you know, he really understands how you do an investigation and, um, you know, he canceled the rest of his work day and went home with his wife, Chris, figuring the detectives would be waiting on their doorstep. Uh, and the only thing they found was a uh, business card left by a reporter huh. asking to be called. Uh, oh, my God. Wow. So now, like you were saying, people were gossiping at the funeral and everything. But now the friends who already couldn't believe it, pretty early on, they're thinking not just, oh, we can't believe this. But now they're thinking, all right, some, something's up here too, like something's being covered. Because word like that's traveling fast. Yeah. I'm, I think – I'm not sure what people thought about the motives of why the investigation was going so poorly. Um, but I think most of the talk centered on – this investigation is going poorly and we need help. We need somebody to really investigate this thing. Uh, so the brothers, I mean, very quickly, uh, early on in this process, they do a few things. They hire an independent medical examiner to do a second autopsy. They didn't just hire a independent <laughs> and independent. They hired the guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's getting, yes, he's a little long in the tooth these days, but uh, he's had a long storied career. That's Michael Bodden. Um, medical examiner to the stars, JFK, um, MLK, yeah. Jeffrey Epstein, yeah. George Floyd. I'm missing a lot of people in between yeah. those years too. Yeah. And he was a New York city medical examiner and they put out his own shingle. Um, and he's had, yeah, some of the biggest cases in, in American history. Um, how soon did the brothers get to, you said they came home on Wednesday, so they, they thought something was up. That was three days after. How soon did they start looking into a guy like Baden? Immediately. Mm. Right. That, yes, that week. Um, I believe it was, uh, it was before the memorial. So I believe it was about five days after their deaths that he conducted the second autopsy. Oh, wow. And, uh, right away. So, yeah. Um, now, what did he find? Well, see, this is super interesting, right? <laughs> uh, he found that the knife wound that killed John Sheridan, there was really no question about Joyce Sheridan. Um, it was, she had large knife gashes that matched a knife that was found in the bedroom, a kitchen, a big chef's knife, a kitchen knife. Um, 
And so that wasn't really what was, uh, you know, in question, but it was more John Sheridan and the so-called hesitation Mm. wounds. Um, So Bodden looks at these wounds and sees that they're about two inches deep. um, And they're very, and it's, it's not that it's a, a large knife that didn't go in very far, only like a hesitation wound means the tip went in, you felt the pain and you brought it back out. This As was, if you're fighting back, like yeah, on someone trying to stab you. Or, or you're trying to stab yourself and it hurts and you can't mm. get yourself to do it. Mm. Um, so he said, no, it was a narrow blade that went deep, um, like a stiletto, you know, a, a knife, you know, like a switchblade. Mm. Um, and he said, so the murder weapon for John Sheridan is not the knife that they found in the bedroom, the kitchen knife that belonged in the, that came from the Sheridan's kitchen. It wasn't a large carving knife. It was a thin bladed knife, like a stiletto or a switch blade. And that knife was never found. So that's huge, right? That, that the knife that killed John Sheridan was not in the room. And so I'm interviewing the, the, uh, Mr. Bo- Dr. Bodden, the medical examiner, and I say, well, I can't imagine any scenario in which someone commits suicide with a knife and the knife's not found near their body. Like, how? Because he had sort of minced his words, like, well, it, it seemed, you know, it, it's suspicious and it's a red <laughs> flag, but you never know, kind of a thing. Odd he things. could have walked a mile away and came back and died. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you know, odd things happen. There was the time he was investigating a case where somebody had tied a bungee cord to the knife and stabbed themselves and the knife flew out the window. Uh, but then at least you'd see the knife hanging out the window, right? So <laughs> it's a it lot was, of effort. <laughs> you know, he acknowledged that he believed the knife was missing, but he said, you can't say definitively because odd things happen, as he put it. Mm. Uh, but uh, to me, you know, and this was just a huge revelation for the Sheridan brothers uh, and immediately... They learn that, and Mark Sheridan calls the county prosecutor and says, you got to come back out and process that crime scene again, and you you have to reinvestigate this. You have a missing murder weapon. Uh, And then he got on the phone with the state attorney general's office, Uh, because remember, I mean, this is a guy who has big connections, and he has people in his phone. Had Uh, he called Christy yet? Chris Christie called him that Sunday that his parents were found dead okay, and to so offer not, his condolences. Not since he was actually looking into this, though. No, and I asked him about that, um, and he he never called... Mark Sheridan says he never called Chris Christie and asked for his help, and that it would have presented... It, it would have been unprofessional and presented a conflict of interest as his attorney to do that. Um, as, as the attorney who worked on the campaign and the attorney for the state Republican Party, that he'd be asking him to do a favor for him in a way that he didn't feel like he should. Uh, quick quick question, though, because, I mean, that's nice of him to think that. I actually wouldn't have that thought. I mean, your parents were just murdered. I don't, I don't think that's the case, but I appreciate him trying to be balanced. W- what's the big difference, though, between calling Chris Christie – or calling some of the other guys involved with the case who know who he is. It's kind of, I mean, obviously Chris Christie has more power. He's the governor of the whole damn state, but... I think the difference is is that Chris Christie was actually his client. And so he has a different kind of relationship with him. Um, It's his job to represent Chris Christie and Chris Christie's interests uh, legally. And I think that, that there are certain... Uh, ethical guidelines that lawyers go okay. by in that situation. It didn't stop him from, and I don't think there's, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with this. He called the uh, chief counsel, who is the you know top lawyer in the state government. He's counsel to the governor, but he's really works for the state. He's not, he's a he's a he's the chief lawyer for the state of New Jersey. He called him first thing when he was on his way to the house Sunday morning. Um, he, he knew he needed to reach the county prosecutor. He didn't know the county prosecutor. And so the chief counsel to Chris Christie, Chris Perino gave, you know, 
made the call to the prosecutor, asked him to call Mark Sheridan and gave him his number. Who was the prosecutor so, again? Uh, his name was is Jeff Soriano. Okay. And what was his... What was his tie to Christie? Because wasn't there stuff after this too? Was he like someone Christie had appointed to that position? Well, the governor or? appoints all the county prosecutors, but Christie um, kind of made a little bit of a show after like a year later when things had really gone south. Uh, Christie made a bit of a show sort of looking like he was firing him. It was really, he didn't reappoint him as prosecutor and it it kind of got played in the media as that Soriano was fired over the Sheridan case but really he he got a job at the attorney general's <laughs> office so he wasn't it wasn't really like a real firing a um, politician doing a fake headline <laughs> ah, never seen that before so yeah so that was Jeff Soriano so um anyway so now you've got going back to the missing knife Mark Sheridan is just, you know, furious that they've done such a bad job. Um, and things, he really, at this point, he expects to see action and he still doesn't get anything. And there were three other brothers who were helping him with this. He was just kind of the point man because of his connections and he was the eldest brother and all that pretty much, right? Yeah. But wasn't there also forgot to ask about this. Wasn't there also one of the brothers, one of the younger ones, had a whole tiff himself with the police while this investigation was going down? And did that, and, and if you don't mind explaining that, number one, but number two, did that also contribute to some of the, let's say, lack of transparency between the detectives and the family? Yeah, this created a lot of... Uh, tension between the family and the prosecutor's office. So, um, Mark Sheridan has, is, uh, there are four brothers and Mark and his brother Matt are twins and they're the oldest. And, um, Matt at the time of their parents' deaths was living at home. Uh, and he had gone away for the weekend. Um, He's really into fishing. And he was away with a friend fishing for the weekend, comes rushing back to New Jersey when he finds out what happened. Um, and when he arrives, uh, the brothers have been asked to come to, I can't remember if it's either the police department or the county prosecutor's office to meet with detectives and give statements. This is like the very first contact. Mm. And so... He arrives at the police station, and in the process, they, they're they giving their statements, and suddenly the detectives, it had to have been the county prosecutor's office detectives, they want to um, search his car. And as Mark Sheridan says, you know, it was like, it was just kind of weird. Like, what what are you doing? He was away for the weekend. Um, there's no reason to search his car and he, everyone knows that he wasn't there and, uh, it just seemed odd. They were all there giving voluntary statements, trying to be as cooperative as possible, uh, the way Mark tells it. Um, so they search his car and they find some drug paraphernalia. Um, so they arrest him. So here these br the brothers are dealing with the death of their parents, the violent death of their parents. They're in shock, for sure. Right? Mark talks about it. And now they've got the detectives who are supposed to be finding out who killed their parents, arresting their brother. Uh, over, and, and so that causes all this conflict, too. Um, ultimately, they would move the case to a different county. Um, and that search would be found to be illegal. And I mean, you know, the Sheridan family hires a lawyer to defend him and they contest the search and the whole case gets thrown out. Okay. I, I just... And so there were some, like there were rumors flying in the, you know, in the town about, oh, this was like some, someone was looking for Matt because he owed the money because he was doing drugs oh. and that this is what it was tied to. And 
Mark Sher- I asked Mark Sheridan about this, and he said uh, there were his mother had had uh, back surgery and back problems, severe, serious back problems, and was on like you know opioids. Oh, and um, and so there were opioids out in the open in the bedroom. There was a pile of cash. His brother had money in the bank. He wasn't like broke right, and right, struggling. Right. And um, they're just like none of the actual facts really lead up to that being a viable motive. And they quickly confirmed that he was in fact out of state while this was going on. Yeah, there's right? there's the, the cell phone said that. the cell phone data checked on all three all four brothers that they were where they said they were. Because I just thought of something while you were saying that, thinking outside the box, a little conspiracy in my head. But he gave the statement at. The prosecutor's offices, right? Yeah. And that's where they conducted the search of his car. I believe so. I could be wrong, and it could have been at the local police department, but I think it was at the county prosecutor's office. Same difference. Did he... So he he was... These charges were dropped because it was illegal. But in the in the conversations with various reporters like you or whatever, has he gone on the record denying that that was his... The drug paraphernalia? I don't think he's ever spoken about it publicly. Okay. Then I won't go, I, I won't go past that then. I, I, I don't think because I would assume he probably was just having a good time with a friend that weekend. And, you know, a lot of people do that, obviously. And then the cops searched his car, which wasn't really a fair thing to do. But if he's not going out and, like, denying it in the whole bit, then I won't. I won't go past that. I had I had another thought about something. But anyway, sorry, not to bring us off track. Mm-hmm. So they, they're they given all the statements. This whole thing, they arrest him. That was the other thing. I didn't realize like they literally handcuffed him there and charged him right away. I didn't realize that. So there's now a ton of animosity between the two. And then they have the meeting on Tuesday where now the prosecutor, as you said, says, hey, we're working on a theory that your, your dad killed your mom. So Baden looks at the body at some point. In the next, let's call it a week, week and a half. Sooner. He, yes. Okay. He Even better. He determines that of the two knives, I think, that were found at the scene, mm-hmm. there's a third knife that's missing. Because as you said, and I fucked that up in the moment when you were saying it, but the hesitation wound obviously was them suggesting that like, oh, he didn't, you know, it's hard to, I can't imagine stabbing myself. I'd imagine I'd probably hesitate too, right? So Bodden comes in and says, well, no, it's just a different knife. So now you have, just reviewing the things we've gone through, you have the blood splatter on the wall that never had a picture taken of it. You have the best medical examiner of all time saying they're missing a literal murder weapon. You have a 70-year-old man who was found beneath an armoire in his house where his wife is dead and the room's on fire. He did all this, no problem apparently. And you have the prosecutors and the sons going at it over something. You have the prosecutors not going and interviewing either Joyce's best friend who met with her two days before or the guy who put the neighbor who pulled out of his house the week before and saw this car. And what what else? I mean, there's a lot. I can't even think of anything else to fuck up, but they, they had other problems too. There was like a fire poacher or something. Was that another thing? Well, let's go back to the blood spatter on the wall. Let's do it. <laughs> In the stairwell, because this is crucial. So... The photo, the 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 significance of the detective not taking the photos of the blood spatter is that the detectives aren't later down the road able to determine whether the smoke stains the soot on the there's soot on the walls from the smoke, right? Mm-hmm. And so that kind of pre- creates a timestamp where you have blood and you have soot, and when the blood is under the soot, the soot's on top, then you know that the blood was there before the fire was started. And when the blood is on top of the soot, then you know the blood was there, say, when the the firefighters dragged out the bodies after the soot was Ah. on the walls. So in the stairwell, and I love this story because it happened, you know, Mark Sheridan is uh, you know, s- notices this when he goes up the stairs for the, and is looking at the crime scene. Uh, but then he allows a Philadelphia Inquirer reporter, Barb Boyer, to come and inspect the house. And the 
he, that was the only reporter he let into the house at that point. Why, why didn't and he let her in? I, she was doing some really good reporting about the case and sort of breaking details and getting, you know, stuff that the, uh, the prosecutor's office wasn't releasing. And I think he thought she was good at what she does. And mm. I don't know. He liked her and he let her in. And um, she brings with her a veteran Philly homicide detective, Eddie Rocks. Is that the guy you interviewed? Yeah. Okay. And um, he's now retired, but, you know, so she, at the time, I he, I don't know whether he'd retired yet, but he's, you know, he knows what he's doing. And they, they're they going up the stairs and they immediately, Eddie Rock says, well, look at that. And it's a spatter of blood on the wall, but it's not like down where the blood is smeared at the bottom of the wall. It's up high. And, and it's not a smear. It's a spatter. And what Eddie Rock says is that shows conflict. Like that's a stab wound happened here and the blood squirts out of a body onto the wall. It shows you direction and it shows you action. And um, so, and then Mark Sheridan sort of examined the whole thing uh, and realized that this spatter on the wall basically matched the height of his father's chest wound if he were like standing at the top of the stairs and they took pictures of all this the family took pictures mm, but the detectives, the detectives did, did yeah. not um so uh here you have i mean this is a major piece of evidence they didn't test the blood of that spatter they didn't do anything with that spatter in the prosecutor's office, the family had the blood tested and it turned out to be their father's blood. So it's a very different kind of scene. I mean, how does he, he, he kill, he stabs himself standing at the top of the stairs. That's a little odd. Okay. And so I, I, I agree with that argument. Let's pull in one other thing to see if there's even a realm of possibility here looking at how the prosecution might have looked at this. That fire poacher I mentioned was found in their bedroom. The fireplace was downstairs, so it would never be in the bedroom. It was obviously a part of whatever went down. Is it possible, according to Eddie Rock, was his name? Yeah, Okay. Is it possible, according to Detective Rocks, that John may have stabbed his wife to death... And then knew he wanted to start the fire. I don't know why he'd get a poacher, but okay. Goes downstairs to get a poacher and somehow the blood ends up there because maybe she fought him a little bit and he had a cut or something like that. Is that possible? That The detective from the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office that I interviewed um, actually made that argument. He said... It's not surprising that he, there would be a blood spatter belonging to John Sheridan on the stairwell wall because we know that he went downstairs uh, to get a fire poker. You're saying poacher, but I think it's poker. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, maybe we should back up and explain the fire poker because yeah, we haven't. But, yeah. but he also, like what the detective was saying is he went down to get the gas can. He got brought up the fire poker. Um, you know, there are, there are many reasons why his blood could be on that wall. That's his argument. I think it's a bad argument, by the way. I want to be clear. I'm just, you know, taking my Hail Mary pass at yeah. what they might do. So the fire poker is another just, you know, astonishing detail. Uh, the Sheridans were avid, avid antique collectors. Hmm. In fact, we're sitting in Mullica Hill and they had a stall at an antique shop in Mullica Hill that they sold they really? loved like buying and then selling antiques on this it was a hobby huh. yeah so um anyway <clears throat> they had a uh vintage antique fireplace set that included this long wrought iron fire poker and it was found not down by the fireplace but up in the bedroom and it had a it was bent <sighs> and john sheridan had bruises across his chest that were thin and narrow and ran 
horizontally across his chest, and he had four or five broken ribs. So he, well, could the ribs have come from the armor? That's what the poli- the detectives thought. They so- thought that his he had a chipped front tooth. And he had the broken ribs and the bruises, and they said that was all caused by the armoire falling over on him. And they believe the armoire fell over on him because the fire, which was started on the floor, right? The gas was poured on the floor, it was lit, and then the the front legs of the armoire had burned, and so that the whole thing tipped over. Um, others say that this armoire didn't really even have legs. It was kind of one of these big chunky things that Mm -hmm. sat very low to the ground and um, that that didn't seem possible. Wow. So so the the fire poker, the police don't take it into evidence, the detectives. Um, They just left it there? And it was in... The bathroom, remember the firefighters are are throwing stuff when they're putting out the fire into the bathroom. An insurance um, adjuster had come to look at the house a few weeks after the crime. And the insurance adjuster is going through the stuff in the bathroom and he finds the fire poker. And uh, here's another situation where Mark Sheridan goes to the detectives and says, hey, you missed this. (laughs) Uh, there were a few of those. Added to the um, list. Um, wow. So, yeah. So there's the, the blood spatter, the fire poker. There's also blood on the thresh. Oh, well, really the biggest kind of like blow your mind moment is um, that there is in the Sheridan's bedroom, there is a door that leads to like a dressing room. And if you go through the dressing room, it leads to a set of stairs, back stairs that go down to the back door. Oh, so they, wow, this is a weird house. Okay. So there are, it's a big house, Um, you know, and a lot of big, some big older houses, not modern ones often had like what are called service stairs in the back for the, for the servants to come up and down, Mm. um, like the grand main stairs. And then there are the back stairs that go to like the kitchen or the back mudroom. Um, so anyway, that's, but they didn't have any live in servants or anything. No, 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 no. no. But, um, remember the reason the detectives are so certain that this was a murder suicide is because the armoire had blocked the door to the bedroom and there was no way in or out. What about the back door? Oh, yeah. So that because the stairs are through the closet. So there is a way out. Yes. And there was blood. Yeah, it was a very bloody scene, the crime scene. And there was blood spilled, Joyce's blood, across the threshold of that back door. But when the, when the, when the detectives arrive, when after the fires started, we know for a fact that that back door was closed. So Mark Sheridan is the one who made this argument to me that the, the back door to the bedroom was open at the time that the knife attack is happening. The back door is open and blood is spilled across that threshold. And then after the fire has started, that back door is closed and you can tell that the back door was closed because there were suits hanging on the, on the door and there was a soot stain that, so that it was clean where the suits were. And then the rest of the door was like gray from the smoke soot. So that shows that the door was closed because it got a, like a blast of smoke on it. Um, but it had been open. Um, and I believe, I mean, it's also another reason why, uh, the, the room didn't burn as badly as it could have is because everything was closed up and there was no oxygen. So the door was open and then it was closed and there was an, another exit that the detectives somehow didn't pay attention to. Can we back up to that door 
for a second, actually. So as you were just explaining that and you're talking about the door shutting, I want to make sure we understand there's two that would be in question, though, because you have the downstairs back door, which we already covered at some point was unlocked, as all the doors were. And then you have this door that was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was through the walk-in closet behind the bathroom upstairs? Yeah. Okay, and that led to these, like, service stairway that went downstairs that then had the back door right there. Yep. Okay. So when you're saying the door shut, you're obviously talking about the one upstairs where the suits were hanging, and therefore, like, the person – if it's shut, that means that the person left and shut the door behind them and then obviously went downstairs through that and, of course, shut that back door so that there's no signs of anything. Could, like people could have. Could have. Could, I would say, yeah. I mean, w- what we know is that both doors to the bedroom were shut. One was blocked by the armoire and was difficult to get in or out at mm-hmm. that point until the armoire was moved. And the back door that led to the back stairs to the, and the back door was also shut at the time uh during the fire and when the police and fire fighters responded to the, to the scene. So, and then there was a, I could throw in one little more detail, which is that, um, uh, Barb Boyer, the gumshoe reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, explained to me how, when you walk in the back door, uh, you would the first thing you would come to was the fireplace and and the fireplace had the fireplace tools on a rack and the very first tool like that you would come to was missing and so you know that when she walked through the house she saw like oh there's something missing there that's not hanging. It's like there's a clip to hang it and there's yeah. nothing there. And uh, then we now, you know, would later find out that the fire poker was upstairs. And did, I don't know if I remember this detail. You definitely said it though. Who found the fire poker again? The insurance adjuster. Right, that was it. Okay. Yeah. So that was a few days later. A few weeks actually. A few weeks. Mm-hmm. So that evidence was just sitting in there the whole time. No one had looked at that. And did you imply that the detectives didn't even bother to realize there were stairs there? That's the implication. I, I at the time that I interviewed the one detective that I spoke with, most of the like the official Somerset County Prosecutor's Office uh, people who were there working there at the time that I was doing all this reporting. Uh, would not speak with me. And basically they say it, it was an open investigation and they couldn't talk about it. Mm. Um, I did track down this one detective who was there at the scene. He was one of the first people to arrive. And um, and he had since retired, and so he was willing to talk to me about it. Um, and he, at the time that I interviewed him... What was his name? Um, uh-oh. How could I forget? There were a lot of people. Barry in the Jansen. Barry Jansen. Okay. Um, and uh, at the time that I spoke with him, I didn't know about the back door, and so I didn't ask him about it. I asked him about other things, the, the fire poker and the missing knife and such, but um, I didn't ask him about the back door. But what I do know is that that was the reason that they told the family over and over again is why it had to be a murder suicide. And, um, wait, what was the reason that there was no way out of that room once? Right. So, which was a lie. Yeah. Or they were mistaken or mistaken. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you would just think one of the first things, and again, not a detective here. I'm literally some guy sitting doing a podcast, but one of the first things, if you're looking at a crime scene that I would ask for is a layout of the scene. Like, if I'm in a building, give me a building layout. I need to know where everything is. I need to know where the air ducts are, all of it, because you can find evidence, you can find ways out, and they bothered to do none of that. And this wasn't even, like, a a huge building. This was a house. I mean, it just doesn't – it seems like, you know, can there be incompetence in cases? Of course. Sure, it happens all the time to some extent. But when I see incompetence 
on top of incompetence, on top of it, like over and over everywhere you look at every level of it, from the bodies to the blood splatter to things not recovered at the scene to not knowing the layout of the house to inexplicably having some reason that, you know, a 70-year-old man would have put an armor on top of himself. It's too much. You know, I, I try to find a reasonable explanation to stuff because we like to turn everything into a conspiracy, but it's just like there's so much here, it's offensive. So they this whole investigation, they make that determination in like roughly three days, and then they confirm it at some point in the few weeks after that. Did they essentially close the case when they did that and stop tracking leads? They do not say that that's what happened, but I think that's every indication in terms of what we know about who was interviewed, uh, what physical evidence was processed. Um, I, you know, I don't think there's any reason to believe there was much investigation once they decided that it was a murder suicide. Right. And they'd already missed all that other stuff too. And some of the stuff you can't even get afterwards. Okay. So let's fast forward for a minute. Three years later, I think there's a giant, I guess like, uh, what's it called? A petition that's signed by a ton of powerful people. I believe Chris Christie even signed it. That was sent to the state of New Jersey that asked the New Jersey State Medical Examiner's Office to change the cause of death on John Sheridan's death certificate to undecided. It was listed as suicide and they wanted to officially change it to undecided. And the medical examiner agreed and did that. At that point, the case was not reopened. So how normal is it for a petition to go out and the official state office to change a cause of death? And then also on top of that, how normal is it that they don't reopen the investigation when that happens? Right. Um, so Chris Christie didn't sign that letter, but but Christine Todd Whitman did. Okay. And I can't remember if there was another former governor on that list, uh, but there were definitely like some former attorney attorneys general and a supreme a former Supreme Court justice. A lot of uh, you know important powerful people signed that mm -hmm. letter. Um, so the what the family wanted was for the death the death certificate listed the manner of death as suicide, and they wanted that changed. Um, and ultimately what they got was, um, undetermined as the manner of death. The cause of death was the knife wound to his jugular. Um, but the, the manner of death, they, you know, had been suicide and they changed it to, um, undetermined. Um, you know, at the time when that they were making this fight, I thought it was really odd that the Republican governor of New Jersey, who is, I mean, governors are very powerful in New Jersey, more powerful than most state yes. governors. The governor of New Jersey, who had a personal relationship with the family, wouldn't have like picked up the phone and called the medical examiner and said, change the death certificate. Like there's a lot of problems here that are being raised let's just, just change the death certificate. It's an easy thing to do, presumably, you know, apparently. Um, and at the time that it was going on, I was just like, why wouldn't he want to do that? Uh, and I don't really have an answer to that question. I'm, I'm not trying to raise it as like, I mean, I don't really know why that didn't happen. Uh, but to me, it was sort of raised a red flag. Like this, there's just, there have been so many things about this story that didn't add up. And that was another one. I mean, so they did get the death certificate changed, but the, the lengths that they had to go through to do that did not make sense to me. Does, I assume Mark Sheridan has no relationship with Chris Christie today. Am I right about that? Um, I, yeah, it's a good question. I did never ask him. Um, I don't know. I don't know if he does or not. Because Chris Christie, you know, Chris Christie was like a perfect New Jersey political machine symbol. He 
He could talk the national politics talk to try to keep himself relevant. That didn't end up working out for him, but he could do that. And then the way it seems to me as someone, you know, it's not like I sit here. I certainly didn't report on it like you did, New Jersey politics and stuff. But in the state, he was a machine deal maker. And then, you know, we saw what happens with like Bridgegate when he does stupid shit to, you know, settle political scores and stuff like that. But one of the unique things about him is that you have George Norcross, who we mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, who's effectively just on the surface. He's a he's maybe the political boss of New Jersey, but, you know, he's one of them. Right. And he's certainly the boss of South Jersey. He happens to represent the Democratic Party in this case. Christie's a Republican. Norcross is a Democrat. They're supposed to hate each other. Right. Not the case. They actually are good friends. And work together a lot and work together rebuilding some things in Camden together. So to me, that's really, really unique, which take away all the context here. I would love to see more Republicans and Democrats being friends, but that's not in New Jersey for people listening. You know, our state is uh, not exactly on the up and up about a lot of things. So that's, you know, you start to think about that and you're like, that's interesting to me that that would be happening so you had said that you started you fell into this with the camden waterfront deal and i didn't ask you for details on that but maybe now is a good time to explain exactly what went on there and i think we can piece that back to some of the stuff that mark then later found in his parents house Mm -hmm. that would make sense yep and let me just say about chris christie and and george norcross um Neither one of them reaches their height of power without the other. It was an incredibly uh, useful symbiotic relationship. Why do you say that? Um, Because Christie, the Republican governor, needed the democratically controlled legislature to get things done. And... He and he had the state senator, Steve Sweeney, who's the most powerful figure in the legislature and has the ability to move bills, to put things, you know, to assign people to committees. I mean, it's a it's a powerful position. And Sweeney is basically the hand picked loyalist to George Norcross. Right. Um, and one of the things I had found in 2019 in my reporting, and we certainly will get to all of that, is that um, I have in my possession an email exchange in which uh, Steve Sweeney, president of the Senate, gets a list of bills that are ready to be put up for a vote. They've gone through their committee process, and now that it's ready to schedule a vote, he, it's his choice to approve what comes up for a vote and what stalls and never goes anywhere. That's just part of like the political system, really. Um, So his uh, assistant sends him, look, these are the bills that are ready to go. Do you want to schedule them for a vote? When is that? uh, This is also 2014. Okay. And uh, Sweeney takes that email with the, the, the bills listed on it forwards it to George Norcross and says, anything on here bother you? (laughs) And George Norcross replies simply with one word, good. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about, I mean, no one's ever been able to really kind of prove how much power or control that George Norcross had over Steve Sweeney. Like you'd often see in news articles, it'd be like Steve Sweeney, the childhood friend of George Norcross. And so reporters would basically say, look, these guys are tight. They're close. Sweeney is a Norcross ally. But like, you know, this is an example of a level of power that nobody had ever really been able to put out there and prove. Um, so to me, that's like just a super important little fact. Hey guys, if you're hearing this right now, you are on YouTube and I need you to listen up for a second because I don't want to confuse you. I want to make this very, very easy. But what I did this week is I split this episode up into two parts. So right now we're at the end of part one. 
What I don't know yet as I'm recording this is whether or not I'm going to post part two an hour or a day after I post part one. So if you do not currently see a link down in the pinned comment and the description to part two, that means I haven't posted it. However, if you want to watch the rest of the episode right now, you can go over to Spotify where we have it on video, the full episode, completely available. If you don't have Spotify downloaded, you can download it for free. It does not cost you any money. You don't have to subscribe, and you'll get the full episode. Otherwise, I'll see you with the next part whenever I post it after you hear this. So thanks as always for watching, guys, and make sure you subscribe and comment down on what you think of the case below.